So, uh, thank you very much for coming this morning. Uh, like Liz said, these are great events. They're really good events because it's quite rare that we can actually get NHS, we can get local authorities, everybody in the room to start talking about some of the stuff that we've learned. And what I'm going to be talking about today actually is some of the more interesting stuff, i.e. the stuff we got wrong. Because <coughs> uh, I think that's much more interesting than all the blurb about what we did right, which most of you will have heard before. Um, sorry, I fidget, so there's no way I can stand on that. I'll, I'll kill myself falling off the side. So, Starting off, the little journey that we went on back in 2011, which is an awful long time ago, um, was an Innovate UK funded programme um, where we had to come together with a bunch of other organisations, which was pretty weird coming from the NHS, um, having to talk to other organisations and people who weren't clinicians or managers, um, was a bit different, especially when they came from the third sector or from housing and, and sorts of other organisations like that that we just weren't used to dealing with. So, Innovate UK put us all in a room and uh, told us to think differently. You've got all these problems coming up, you're going to have to think very differently about how you work and how you react to some of that, and you have to talk to industry in a very different way. So, Paul, who sat there in the middle, we, we, we thought, right, we've got to get funky, we've got to think differently. Um, so, we got down with the people, um, and, and we started to think, OK, What's funky in this stuff? How do we do this differently? What does it look like when we put industry hats on and we're not from the NHS anymore? Um, and that happened. We came up with a programme called the Feel Good Factory. Okay? We quickly learnt that that was not a good idea. Um, and we got a bit too funky. And after we got a few inquiries about what the programme did that were a bit worrying... Um, <laughs> we decided that maybe that wasn't the right brand. Um, so we did a bit more work on the back of that, spoke to the public, um, spoke to practitioners, spoke to industry, and that's why my was born. More Independent did a lot more about saying what it did on the tin than the Feel Good Factory, um, and the uh, dodgy inquiries ceased at that point. So, what was my all about? The fundamental lesson that we learnt throughout the programme was that if you work with industry, you work with your local authority colleagues, you work with everybody in a partnership and actually value their expertise and what they can bring to the par partnership, not in a suspicious way, and I'm looking at Alan at the front <laughs> as we work together on this, not in a suspicious way, but to say, actually, you know, big industry, Philips, one of the companies that we partnered with, and say, actually, how did you solve... Have you ever come across that before? You, have you ever solved that in France, Germany, the US, where you've worked on this kind of stuff before? And actually looked at it and said, right, now we get it, and started to adopt some of that practice. That made a huge difference to how we've worked on this programme, and that has made a huge difference as to our current programme and how we're working today in terms of what we've done. Now, it is the NHS, and yes, we do move slowly in these things, so the flares are still in the wardrobe. We're not quite back to that as a whole organisation. However, it did allow us, and it gave us some freedom to accept the fact that in innovation and technology, we're still very scared of that word fail. And my goodness me, over those few years that we've been doing this, have we failed? We failed a lot, a lot. And we've done all sorts of things wrong. Um, but the, the only reason we've done anything right today is because we got it wrong that many times and didn't stop. So, some of the lessons we learnt. That was an interesting one. The kit was never right when we first got it, and that's what we expected. So it was both unfair of us to ask industry to have designed something that we really wanted but hadn't actually explained to them what it was we wanted, Equally, industry were on a, a hiding to nothing because they were producing something that they thought we wanted and it wasn't. And we kind of got to that point where actually we got to there and said, right, OK, we need to now tell you what we want because we know what works on the front line, we think, and you need to go away and build it for us. And sometimes it's tweaking it, sometimes it's actually, really, that does not work. And they're sometimes really difficult conversations, but when you're part of a partnership where you actually agree to be honest with each other, that's what you've got to do. The other part of it was, and this is the biggest single lesson we learnt over all the years, is the technology doesn't really matter that much. If it doesn't fit into business as usual, if the people on the front line don't want it or it doesn't achieve what they want, forget it. It doesn't matter how clever the technology is, how marvellous it might seem, how revolutionary everybody calls it, if the people on the front line aren't going to put it into their service, forget it. Who's going to use it? Nobody. 
Nobody but nobody. And we, we picked up over the years all this fancy kit that said it'd do this, that and the other, and it failed and failed again. And the reason is, is because we never spoke to the people on the front line and said, what's the problem we need to solve? And actually, will you use this to solve it? And we kind of came to the solution that actually sometimes innovation doesn't always involve digital. And when we got to that point, actually, we changed some services without actually putting any technology in. And that one was a few hearts and minds along the way that actually we weren't ramming tech down people's throats just for the sake of it. And they were huge lessons that it took us a lot of getting it wrong to learn. We were, we were asking um, classic one. We, we put telehealth out there and we asked our district, uh, uh, sorry, our community nurses, um, uh, community matrons to, to run this technology. Why? Because they deal with our most sick patients. So we're going to get great returns out of this. <laughs> um, nope, we didn't. What it actually turned out to do was when we stood back and looked at it and thought, why is this not working? It was simple. We've given some of our busiest nurses the job of putting technology into people who are so ill they don't want the technology. Yeah? Now, when you step back and do that, you go, mm, yeah, all right, yeah, that kind of makes sense. Missed that one, sorry. Okay? So when we ended up doing is then giving the technology to our GPs because we realised actually they look after everybody at the end of the day. Everybody ends up back at general practice whether they've been in hospital or not. Then we got that bit wrong too. Um, and then we discovered that actually giving GPs more work to do in a 10 minute consultation. <coughs> oh, sorry. Uh, somebody objected. Um, <laughs> is there a GP in the audience? No, sorry. Um, giving GPs more work to do in a 10 minute consultation, asking them to you know, decide on technology, explain what it is. Yeah, and you stand back and you go, mm, but that was obvious as well, wasn't it? So in the end, what we ended up doing is working with the GP practices and we did the work. So we found all the patients for them and they simply signed them off at the end of the day en masse. That worked. So again, got it wrong, got it wrong again, got it wrong again, and then we started to make some progress and that was what this partnership was all about. And again, it was coming back to our partners in local authority, partners all over the place that talked about social care, we worked very close through social care, and they were looking at all the systems and issues that, that, that were in there that again, in the NHS, we weren't considering properly. So, what did that lead to? That, leaded, that led to, shall I say, um, a new programme that, that was funded by the CCG. So, we managed to convince the CCG that actually, once our funding had run out, that technology and innovation was so important, so important, that actually it needed to be on the same level as transforming our hospitals, our community services, and all of the things that you see up there, living well programmes, public health, everything else. Why? Because actually, we've got to get that bit right, otherwise we can't transform the other stuff. Um, so that's where the Digital Care and Innovation programme came from. And it's come from all of those mistakes that we still, actually, still making a few. Um, so, what's that all about? So, we've got a few different things in there. Of course, it wouldn't be the NHS, and if we didn't mention governance a lot, so I'm not going to mention it again. Um, but there are four key elements to the programme, and we've moved on a lot from our original thinking. So as you can see up there, um, I'm not going to talk about integrated uh, health and care records. That's my colleague Kate's job, and she knows far more about it, and I'll get it wrong. But um, person held records, which is now around digital platform, and I'll give you a bit more on that later. Predictive analytics. I can see Dave here from Hartree. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that later as well. And then assistive technology, which I'm going to come to next. And together, what we're looking at is bringing those four elements together to give us more of a holistic digital programme to support everything that we need to change across the NHS. Because actually, and I'll come back to this later, the future is about intelligence. What we found is that digital technology, no matter in what way it does it, whether it automates things, A, it generates data, and B, makes us more efficient if you do it in the right way and put it in the right place. But we've got to accept the fact that we've never, to this day, even IBM's Watson can't replace people, although I heard last week it got close. Um, so, what do we do with assistive technology? It's not here to replace people. When you mature and you look at, actually, as an organisation, what is it, digital? How do we mature our thinking? That's what we've got to so far. Forget about the kit. Don't start with the kit. Kit's irrelevant. Don't worry about it. You've got to get to the point where what does the service need, where are the service issues, and what, what do we need to do? And accept the fact that digital might not be the answer at the end of it. And what we found in going through that process is digital normally is the answer at the end of it, or at least part of the answer. Because technology is so good now 
that we can actually use it to improve services come what may. That is a key point that we learnt along the way. We had such expectations around technology. This is the new thing, it's going to change everything. Then it didn't. And then the new thing came along and that didn't change everything either. And what we found is, coming back to the same old thing, people change things. People change the way that they work, the way that they do things, the way that they interact with people. They use the tools that technology gives them to make that change. And that was the big realisation we made, is that you've got to accept that technology isn't that smart. People are, but they can work smarter with the technology. The expectation we put on technology and new kit and all the rest of it always leads us to much higher expectations than we should have of it, and then we start using it in the wrong way. Evidence, oh, evaluation, oh. um, I find it really frustrating um, because at the end of the day you do need evidence, actually you've got to prove what you've done works, I get that. Um, often where I find this little problem is that actually we tend to deploy technology sometimes to get the evidence rather than get the right result. So. Another lesson we learned, because we did that wrong as first as well, was randomised control trials, all that kind of stuff, doesn't work with technology. You might as well do it on a parachute. The bottom line is, you can't, for pharma, it's brilliant. Two pills, this one's sugar, this one's the actual drug. Give one to one person, one to the other, neither isn't any. It doesn't work with technology. Here's technology. Use it or don't use it. Oh, hang on. That doesn't work. Because if somebody doesn't want to use technology as an individual, they're not going to use it. So how do you then evaluate that? How's that a fair evaluation? It isn't. So what we ended up doing is designing a new way of starting to evaluate technology, whereby we use the data that we had in the NHS. So we matched everybody who we put on telehealth with three other individuals on age, their risk of admission or their polypharmacy, and a whole bunch of other parameters. Three people for every one. And then we monitored those people on the technology and we monitored those people not on it. Same conditions, same multi-comorbidities, etc. And we found those results. That up to a third less cost and less admissions, emergency admissions, when you evaluate it in a real life situation. But the difference was we deployed the technology by cheating in evaluation terms because we put the technology in the right place through GPs and through the right selection process, then guess what? We asked the people if they wanted the technology and only the ones who said, yeah, I want the technology, did we give it to? <sighs> That's cheating from a research point of view, isn't it? But how else do you get it to work? It's ridiculous to do anything else. And then you wonder why people say, well, all this technology costs too much. Well, it does if you give it to people who don't want it. Duh. So, again, we had to go down that route of designing a new way of evaluating it and you get, you tend to find then that's the truth that sits behind it. But we come back to business as usual. So what we're doing now in Liverpool is that our GPs now prescribe this. And Anne's over there, she'll tell you all about it. It runs that sir. A, and, um, and actually went through the procurement process, so we've now got, we went through a joint procurement between the NHS and the, and the local authority, so all that technology in the one place, how very sensible. Um, but it took us a while, didn't it, Anne? But um, to the point now where actually it's now business as usual. So we now have, I think it's between 40 and 50 GPs every month prescribing fall detection equipment out to our, out to our patients that they're worried about that's going to fall. And we've, our evaluation is not complete yet. It's not the easiest thing to do, that one. But the, the data that's coming back off our centre is around about 100, 120, 999 calls avoided by using that kit. We've still got an awful lot of work to do because we're not using the kit to its maximum advantage at all because we're not using the data that's coming back off that to get the people into gait analysis and all the other things like that. That's coming. So what's the future look like? because it's coming quick. Um, so, oops. Um, so, what does the future look like? I want to challenge everybody here, and this is not going to make me popular, but the words digital exclusion. I want you to think about it slightly differently. What if digital exclusion wasn't us worrying about the fact that when we digitise something, people who don't like digital won't be able to use it? What if we considered it in the terms that all of our services so far have been built in non-digital ways, historically, therefore the digital exclusion that we're really suffering from at the moment is that everybody who wants to use digital can't. 
that's a very different type of digital exclusion. And what we've got at the moment is a growing generation of digital natives who expect all this to happen. Why is it that we disempower people when they go to work in the NHS? They come in and go, oh, oh hang on, I've got to be stupid now. Can't use a smartphone. Uh, oh, paper. Um, novel. And I don't wipe, no. Um, so, again, and our patients are exactly the same. Welcome to the NHS. You're now stupid. There's your bed. Okay? So, again, we're looking again at... What are we doing to move forward? We're trying to reimagine what all that looks like in terms of digital exclusion. Actually, what we shouldn't be doing is excluding people who don't like digital services, but we shouldn't be excluding people who do. And at the moment, we've got the vast majority of services that are non-digital. We should be running digital ones in parallel as a minimum. Predictive analytics. We're very lucky in this area. We've got uh, the Hartree Institute over in Daresby. Dave's there. He has already waved once. Wave again for us, Dave. There we go. They've got a massive computer. No idea how it works, but it's huge. They even let me see it. It's like a big black box. Um, so, but it's a huge computer. And what we're, what we're getting to guys, with these guys is their data. They've got data scientists and they've got this massive facility there. Um, linked to the central government, and we're so lucky because it's in Daresby, it's on our patch. And we're starting to work with these guys now to look at how can we be clever about what we do with our data? How can we start to actually predict episodes of care before they occur? Now, we already use the Welsh model, which actually gives us... Oh, I hope there's no media in here. Um, it actually gives everybody in Liverpool a number. And what it says is, you, this is your uh, risk score, i.e. how likely you are to enter into uh, emergency care um, over the next 12 months. How, how likely you are to have an emergency admission. And it's 77% accurate, which is pretty good for a predictive tool. So we give everybody a percentage score at the beginning of the year, and we update it every month to say, how likely is this individual to go into, into care? Well, if we can do that, then we can do some much more exciting things with a big computer. Um, and that's what we're starting to work on now in terms of data and analytics. And we've actually got quite far along there. We've even got the data sharing agreements with all of our trusts. Hartree's ready to roll with it. These guys are now IG compliant with the NHS. We've sent in the high-vis brigades with the clipboards and everything. They've done their tests. Um, and we're now at the point where we're starting to actually look at our wish list for predictive analytics to start to say, OK, on the front line, what difference does it make? Now, we've actually learnt one of our own lessons, I'm really proud to say, which is we're now looking at, at predicting episodes of care that we can actually do something about. Um, rather than saying, well, we can predict that, and then saying, ah, well, we've predicted it, there's absolutely nothing we can do to change that outcome. So what's the point in predicting it? So we're actually now going through a list of what's predictable, but what's actually, where can we intervene in that period? So, that all goes on to an entirely what we're aiming for, an intelligent NHS system. Wouldn't that be great? Where actually we see real-time information and we can react as we go along. Digital no wrong, don't going to fly through this because Liz is going to get the shepherd's hook on me in a second. Um, again, digital platform, digital no wrong door is what we're calling it in Liverpool, which is why if you... Google NHS, and you might go onto the Royal Liverpool's website or Entry Hospital's website. Why can't you then go and make a GP appointment? It doesn't happen at the moment, and it's quite a simple thing. We need to be more linked up. But then why can't we do more clever things? So one of the things we're working with NHS England, the government digital service on, is you're being able to actually identify yourself online and see your NHS record without having to rock up to your GP practice with your passport and say, I'm me. So that's the next project that we're running at the moment. Hopefully in about six months we'll, be, we'll, we'll have completed the pilots for it. So actually be able to go onto the NHS site, identify you with the Government Verify service, and then get your NHS number and see your records. My issue with that is, so what? I'm not aware of anybody, and, and tell me if I'm wrong, who, who really, really wants to see their record for any particular reason. So the issue that we've been coming across, again, and trying to learn the lessons of the past, which is, what do people actually want to use that information for? It's like, oh, I've seen my GP record, I'm cured. What? The point being, we need to release that information to people so that they can use apps and other things like that that can do something useful with that information. Meds management apps. What if I could download all of my meds from my general practice record and then it can tell me about, my, about the... Uh, the 
the drugs that I'm taking. What if all that could happen? That's what we're working on at the moment, a platform that can enable that, but we're not building the apps ourselves because we're rubbish at it, right? We can't keep up. We're still building Friends Reunited in the NHS. Everybody's still on, everybody's on Twitter, right? OK, we're just not quick enough. So what we're trying to do is build a platform here that allows industry to work with us to keep up with the market, but what we can do is facilitate the stuff they can't get access to in the NHS. That's what we're trying to get to, trying to learn those lessons of the past. So, final slide, promise list. Um, acronyms, oh, God, yes, I love an acronym. We love an acronym in the NHS. Let me, right, rule of thumb. If you don't work in the NHS, right, you hear all this policy stuff that's going on. If we haven't given an acronym, don't bother, right? We're not serious about it, okay? So as you can see up there, we've got sustainability and transformation plans, local digital roadmaps, uh, local delivery systems, digital maturity assessments, five-year forward view. Oh, that's serious stuff, OK? So we love an acronym. All those acronyms generally mean, ooh, finances are a bit tight. <laughs> OK? That's what they're all about. How do we, so all this stuff is about, ooh, we're a bit short on cash, especially if you've read The Echo and the BBC yesterday. Um, OK, so... This is what these plans are all about. But what I would say is, although a lot of us in the NHS are really worried about this stuff, OK, we are short of money. It is going to get tighter. In terms of innovation and technology, I've got to say, the feeling I'm getting now is this is the best opportunity we've ever had this generation to do something. Because those people who want to do business as usual the way they always have are being told you can't do that anymore, quite simply. So if you're in this room now and you, you're looking at doing new things, new ways, now is your chance. Now is the time because the NHS is looking at itself really seriously, right fundamentally, from top to bottom and going, we've got to do something really, really different. So all those TLEs are telling you, now's the time to take it on. And that's me. Thank you.